Good morning, my name is Frank Smith, or good afternoon, depending on when you're watching this film. Uh, I'm with Pipe Tech, and we're talking about critical surge solutions uh, in the fracking uh, market with regard to uh, bringing water into the well for the fracking purpose. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, computer surge analysis, looking at pump starts, be it uh, bringing in the frack water from a reuse water location, uh, potable water, or um, even using river palm water uh, as the, the water coming into the booster pumps and then feeding the high service water pumps for the fracking application. We're going to be looking at and addressing the control valves, the pumps, the operation, the flow, maintaining the flow, um, looking at the, the pump, pumps running on their curve, and what happens when we have pump trips and application. If we look at this picture I have on the screen, this is a, our typical uh, control valve, flow control, frack skid. Where we're maintaining a constant pressure and flow rate into the booster pump. Uh, in this application, we're trying to maintain 15 PSI into the suction side of the pump and a flow rate of 1,600 gallons per minute. Uh, this is as we're feeding the frack pump, which I'll discuss later in the, the modeling details and looking at the change in flow and pressure and how it uh, affects the overall system. Uh, in this case, we're looking at, as I said, the control valves maintaining a flow rate of 1,600 gallons per minute, uh, also pressure reducing where we're taking a higher pressure and breaking it down to exactly 15 PSI as we feed the booster pump. Uh, there is also relief valves, whereas if while they're fracking the system, they, they close a valve or they're trying to balance the flow into the frack pump, they close a valve, we end up with shock waves coming back to the frack skid, uh, and this is creating some uh, damaged equipment. Um, the primary piece of equipment that's getting damaged in the field is the uh, injection pumps, where we have our, our Blaco dampeners. Um, the shock waves are coming back, which are exceeding the pressure rating of the piping system and causing damage. So in this case, we're going to be discussing uh, surge relief valves, relieving high pressure in the system, but also dealing with that actual flow rate. Because if we had a relief valve relief or a rupture disc blow off, under the worst case scenarios. Now we have to deal with and contain this excess water in the frack application. So we're going to be looking at overpressurization, also giving and receiving energy from a, a, a pulsation dampener or a bladder vessel to give and receive energy uh, as we're trying to maintain a constant flow into this frack application. Now, when we're running the, the, the high pressure pumps, a variance in flow and pressure can create transient waves, which we'll address as we're pumping down into the earth, say 10,000 feet. Our computer models can simulate what's happening uh, under those circumstances also. So let me take a step back in our model and look at a 24-inch uh, pipeline that um, we're pumping several miles um, supplying water to several applications for, for fracking, and we look at and model the worst case scenario. Uh, in this case, it was how they're operating the pumps, and this would be, say, the raw water pumps. In this case, we're pulling water out of a river several miles away, and as we started the pumps up, we charged the system, we started um, supplying feed water to the frack pump. Um, the startup and shutdown was critical in the application. So the first day we started the process and how we wanted to have a normal operation of the system, be it with the control valves, manipulating the valves, manipulating the flow, how to start and stop the pumps, the first day went very smooth. The second day we weren't there. Um, and we proceeded that they were going to follow our you know, startup instructions. So they started through the frack process, supplying the, the pumps with water, all went well, 
and then they turned off the pumps. Instead of manipulating a control valve and the flow in the system as it fed the pumps. The result was a little boo-boo. Uh, when they turned off the pump seven miles down um, this lane, a negative wave traveled up through the piping system which went to cavitation, minus 14.7. That negative wave traveled up into our skid. The skid to the, the right uh, basically weighs 70,000 pounds. We're, we have eight different connections where we can maintain a flow rate of 1,600 gallons per minute. Well, that negative wave came up, moved this skid about seven inches, and reflected back as a high pressure wave as that um, minus 14.7 water, which at that point were in cavitation, water cannot exist as a liquid, it hit the back of the skid and it uh, collapsed and we had a huge upsurge. Well, that upsurge high pressure wave oscillated back out, as you can see, ripped apart the expansion joint, pushed the 24 inch ductile iron 90 uh, outward as it expanded uh, and then oscillated back down the piping system as a positive wave. Of course, in this application, there was not a relief valve at this point. And even if there was a relief valve, it would have, uh, the high pressure wave traveled through the whole seven miles of piping system. Uh, when we get in looking at the modeling system, you see we have air vacuum valves in the system. But once we drop below minus seven, minus six PSI, the air vacuum valve cannot allow any more air into the piping system, so we still drop to uh, the minus 14.7 in the line. So if this happened accidentally as we were in the frack process and the feed water process, you'll see in our piping system there's a lot of temporary piping, a lot of hose, a lot of uh, aluminum pipe that is you know, fed off into many different directions and used to uh, supply water for the fracking process. So if we create a, a pressure wave or a pressure spike, this piping is going to start to move. It's not restrained in the system. So we want to minimize any transients as much as possible. So in this case, we're also getting into a risk assessment of what our piping is going to be doing. It's unrestrained and we've got to really minimize the transient as much as possible. So here's an example of a, a computer model that we'll be discussing where we've got um, several, several tanks bringing in water, booster pump, supplying water to uh, the, the actual high pressure injection skid. And we use this as an example to see if we do have a transient occur, how can we relieve or accept this energy as it occurs? And this is typically, again, someone operating a valve at the end of the skid right before the deep well injection. And what happens when we shut that valve, we have a high pressure wave oscillating back at us. Well, can we put in a relief valve to relieve um, this high pressure wave to protect your equipment, including the, the Blaco pulsation dampener? Uh, and also, in looking at this in a modeling, in, in and trying to fine tune this particular relief valve so that we don't have excess water being discharged. So the rate in which this control valve, relief valve opens up and then slowly closes to minimize the transient, we try to simulate this all in a computer model. Uh, again, another example of a, uh, uh, a frack skid where we're maintaining pressure and flow. Uh, and again, in this particular skid, there's rate of flow control, pressure reducing, and then also pressure sustaining as we're trying to sustain a flow rate into a, uh, a pump suction. Uh, this would be an example of one of the skids where, uh, in this case, you see that the end cap is just a piece of welded steel versus a, uh, a tube turn type cover. When that transient came up into this particular skid, we blew out this back plate uh, where the, the two inch hose is connected to. Again, looking at worst case scenarios and, and what can actually happen from a transient standpoint. This would be an example of uh, where we're doing our chemical injection and mixing. Um, typically, and in this case, we're dealing with fiberglass piping system because of the corrosion issues. So we, 
we're dealing with PVC or fiberglass pipe, which is holding a ANSI 150 pound pressure rating. So when we exceed the pressure in these fittings, um, if we're exceeding 285 PSI, we end up damaging the pipe. Uh, and again, these are the, the fragile pieces within the system, uh, and it's because of the corrosiveness of the fluid. So this would be the injection point where we're injecting different fluids in the, the frac process. And we're looking at, and this is just a screenshot of uh, looking at the pressure wave kind of before and after. Uh, this is where we've set in a pressure relief valve to relieve that high pressure wave if we were shut in. To give you an example, we were able to solve the issue by putting in a relief valve. The, the red line shows what happens if we did not have that relief valve. So you can see we're exceeding uh, 450 PSI, which would be damaging to our fittings here as I was showing, the PVC piping or fiberglass piping only rated to 285, 275 PSI. So here's the problem, and then we're going to look at modeling details of how we actually solve that problem in bringing the frac water to the injection point. Uh, this is again another example of a model that we'll go into a little more detail, just showing the, the detail in, the, in bringing frac water to that well site. Um, and what needs to take place from a computer modeling standpoint and a risk assessment to get the water um, to the point of use. Uh, we also look at the, the flow rate and as we're bringing the water through our control valve, feeding the pump, uh, trying to balance the flow as much as possible and using various different types of straightening veins and flow conditioners coming out of our skid, whereas we're we're mixing the chemicals from our ejection standpoint, but trying to control the flow into the, the pump itself. And one of the worst case scenarios is, is the, the frac water and then the, the condensate coming out of the well in the corrosiveness of the fluid. Uh, one of the biggest issues we've had was with the air vacuum valves. As I mentioned on that seven mile skid, we have dozens of air vacuum valves. Uh, under normal circumstances, we might be operating at 100 PSI, but when this system is shut down, our static pressure might be less than two or three PSI on top of a hill. One of the issues we had with air vacuum valves was that they were misapplied, not modeled correctly, and they weren't designed for low pressure applications. Um, the majority of manufacturers that make air vacuum valves for this type of application, um, they're looking at a minimum pressure of 2 PSI. And this depends on the drama of the rubber and the seal. But when we drop below 2 PSI, um, you, you run the risk of the valve leaking. If the valve starts to leak, um, you can see here, it's a, you run the risk of an environmental issue. So as you see, we have a tank to catch any of the liquid that leaks out of the tank. After several of these air valves in service, we went back to another manufacturer, developed a product that will seal under nine inches of water column. Again, trying to address the, the surge water hammer flow issue, but then uh, creating a new product for this particular application. We also look at uh, giving and receiving energy. Uh, in several locations where we have water coming from a reuse pump station used to frack you know, multiple wells, we'll have permanent piping as you saw in that 24 inch ductile iron line. At the pump station or at the, the frack site where we'll have our skid, we might put in a surge vessel as you see here. At the pump station, we'll put a surge vessel conditioning the flow and pressure and giving energy to pump trips and then at the frac skid, installing a dampener to accept energy as they're opening and closing valves to try to minimize that transient, again, because our piping is very flexible and unrestrained. Uh, example of this also is on the bottom left-hand corner is one of our Pipe Tech transient monitoring computers. It's one to look at a system, especially in a frac water application. Uh, you can design everything uh, so everything is perfect with regard to the pumps, the operation, the flow, the setting of the control valves uh, in a computer model. 
we put our computer system out there to uh, look at, maintain, and monitor the system from a pressure standpoint. Under normal operation, this, this computer system takes a running average of the pressure and at a time step. If a transient occurs, say they're in a frack process and the operator shuts an 8-inch butterfly valve in a couple seconds, creating an upsurge. This is a human error or human training scenario. This computer system will pick up that upsurge and then we're going to see that upsurge oscillate back to our relief valve or to our surge vessel. So we can record day-to-day -day operations and try to identify human error in this system uh, to again provide training in the field and then to try to create a better design system. So it'd be an example of the uh, a frack pump, which we're dealing with high pressures pumping down into the earth, you know, nine, ten thousand feet, and under high pressure applications. And again, I'll show you in a computer model uh, more simulation of the pressures that we're working at, you know, five, six thousand psi at this point. And it's critical of how we feed this pump to keep uh, the pump running on its curve and maintaining a, a net positive suction head on the pump itself. If that varies or the pump you know, oscillates on its curve, it will create transients, uh, and those transients are reflected down into the earth you know, 10,000 feet. And again, in our computer simulation, we can simulate what happens in that circumstance and look at the pressure oscillating back and forth. Uh, in, that w in detail, we'll show you in a computer model showing you what happens under a, a pump trip and how that wave reflects down. And again, from a frack water application, as we're mixing our chemicals and sand and injecting this into the well, um, creating huge pressures and breaking up that shell, uh, and how that affects the pumps and everything on the top side that we don't have a, you know, a, we don't supersede the pressure rating of the pipe, even the piping in the ground. When I mentioned field testing, again, this is you know, verifying your design in the field. When we have a new frack skid going out and looking at training individuals, as I say, we, we want to be uh, on hand in the field as they're going through the frack process so they understand what's actually happening from their pressure standpoint so they can maintain their system properly. In this case, they, they're running a pump, they kick off the pump, and they generate this high pressure wave. Well, this high pressure wave, we can expand out and look at the cause and effect of you know, when the check valve closed and what the maximum pressures were, what the time step, and then compare this back into a computer surge analysis to try to fine tune the system in the field. Uh, from there, in, in trying to develop products to solve the problems that we see in the field, this would be an example of a, a special safety relief valve that we have in the field that's dealing with high pressure waves, but also low pressure scenarios where I would have to break to a vacuum condition. If I was under a, a, a vacuum scenario, I want this valve to open up before that occurred. Also, if there's a high pressure wave occurring, how this valve is going to react. So you'll see we can tie this control valve back into the SCADA system so we can see how it's operating in the system. Uh, in this case, the valve is open as a vacuum breaker um, to get all the air out of a piping system as we're starting our charge pumps. When we pressurize the system, this valve will then go closed. And again, it's how to manage your water flow and excess water flow, because again, this water coming through this relief valve is going to be stored in a frack tank. So this valve then will go closed and is waiting for a transient event, a high pressure event, which then will, again will fire off into the frack tank itself. When we get into manipulating the actual pumps, uh, as we're supplying wa water, in this case we're pumping out of a river, it's ma maintaining the start and stop of those pumps so that we don't create a transient. Again, this is the, the primary feed pump to this application. In this case, we're pumping into a 24-inch line 20 miles. So any transient and starting and stopping of these pumps affects that whole 20 mile piping system and also the intake to how we're trying to maintain that flow into the injection pump. 
So it's critical of how we manipulate the starting and stopping of these uh, turbine pumps. When we start the pump, in this case, uh, the control valve, that's an uh, angle pattern relief valve. That's, again, a relief valve, but it's normally open when we start the pump. Um, and this valve is sized for the pump to allow the pump to come onto the curve and to get rid of the startup surge of that turbine pump. Uh, that valve is says normally open when we start up the pump and then we have a pump control valve that's manipulating the flow and pressure into our, our pipeline. So when we start up the pump, the small valve is open, the pump that stays open for a duration of time allowing the vertical turbine pump to come onto its curb and then that'll slowly close as the pump control valve slowly opens up. And again, in our computer simulation, we can see how fast do I allow this pump to allow pressure and flow into the system so I don't get a startup surge. Typically, by manipulating the pump this way, we can minimize the startup surge. And typically, a pump shutdown is six times worse than a pump startup except for when we get into vertical turbine pump scenarios. We've had applications where our vertical turbine pump is set to pump 100 PSI, 1,000 gallons per minute, but we had uh, uh, the static water level was 100 feet into the earth. So when we started up the pump, there's no load on the pump. So the pump automatically starts to run off the curve and flow off to the right-hand side of the curve. But we're, we're basically pushing air at this standpoint. And then when we encounter you know, flow of water through the system, the pump shoots back to the left-hand side of the curb, and we have huge pressure spikes. With our transient monitoring equipment, we've been able to document this event after the customer says, keep blowing apart and damaging my piping system. Is it the piping system? Is it my pump? What's going on in the system? By hooking up our computer to the system, we're able to evaluate that startup process. And again, this case, when the pump was shooting far off the left-hand side of the right-hand side of the curve and coming back, it went from a pump that's designed to pump at 100 psi. The pressure was exceeding 550 psi upon startup. So you can imagine shooting a 550-pound pressure wave into our piping system that's only designed to, to say 285 psi. The missing link is those 45s to, you know, the 90, the flange of its, you know, that's that's the weak link in the piping system that we've seen several times piping blowing apart. So in this case, as I said, we're manipulating the startup of the pump. Likewise, when we go to shut down the pump, which is again that drastic change in velocity can uh, affect the pressure wave as that negative wave will oscillate out away from the piping system. So we win, want to minimize our change in velocity over a, a time step of say at least you know, 60 seconds to five minutes. It just depends on uh, what we see in the computer model, the length of the pipe, and our flow velocity in the system. The lower the velocity, the lower chance of a transient occurring not occurring, but being having a detrimental. So you're looking at a velocity change of one foot per second velocity. You're looking at doubling the, the pressure. So if you had two feet per second, 100 PSI, you could get a 200 PSI pressure spike. It's kind of my rule of thumb, but there's a lot of variables in there. And this is why we do a computer simulation of uh, the, the change in velocity in the system. So in this case, we take our pump control valve uh, in this application, and you'll see in the computer model, we're going to slowly close this valve uh, in 60 seconds. As we're slowly shutting off the flow and velocity into the system, then we're going to start to back the pump up on the curb. At the point where we start to move the pump back onto the curb, we're going to open up our, our relief valve. It's going to start to open up and relieve that excess pressure so we don't overpressurize and damage the piping between the pump control valve and the pump itself. When the pump control valve has closed and say that 60 second time step, then there's a limit switch on top of the valve, which you might be able to make out. That'll trip and turn off the pump. And when we turn off the pump, the deep well relief valve is open at that point and it allows air to fall in behind as that water drops in the, the well column itself. 
So we're manipulating the starting and stopping of the pump. This is a great scenario. The problem is uh, what happens if we have a power failure? I'm no longer manipulating that pump. So from a computer surge analysis standpoint, we're looking at the worst case scenario. Even if these are variable speed pumps, we have to look at the pump running at full speed. A lot of people think, oh, instead of going through all that, I'm going to put in a soft start. The soft start in the system is there to protect the power company, the inrush of electricity into the motor itself. It's not there to protect uh, the system from a transient standpoint. So that soft start is, you know, you're adjusting it in seconds of the, the inrush of power coming into the motor and it doesn't have any effect from a transient standpoint. Um, variable speed drives are great when we look at starting up and stopping so you can minimize the transient in the flow velocity in the system but you have to look at where that motor is at say um, 30 hertz. You know, at 50% of that motor, where do we actually have flow in the system? And doing a computer simulation and putting our transient monitoring computer system in the field, we can balance out those variable speed drives again to cushion the system as we're starting the frack water process. When uh, events occur, say uh, a transients or uh, shock waves, if this was an application where we're pumping up a hill um, with our frack water uh, and we create a transient um, and it's a high pressure application where my negative pressure going out is not that bad so I don't need a surge vessel but my high pressure wave coming back can exceed the pressure rating of a pipe this is where we put in a, a surge anticipating valve that anticipates the shock wave traveling through the piping system so again, this is a safety relief valve um, that would be installed at the pumps. And again, this is a, a well injection site where we're going down between five and 6,000 feet uh, into the earth, and this is the feed water. So if our booster pump uh, overpressurizes or we shut in our injection pump, which is going to create an oscillation of a high pressure wave back into our low pressure piping, this valve will relieve the uh, excess pressure. It senses the negative pressure wave going out and fires the valve open so that it is open by the time the high pressure wave comes back. And again, this is a valve that we, we model and uh, doing a computer surge analysis and model how this valve is going to react in the field. And then it's again calibrated the pilots with our transient monitoring computer. When we talk about surge vessels giving, giving energy, uh, in this case, we're taking reuse water, which will be a, another class that Blaco is offering in reuse water applications. But a lot of reuse water from, say, your sewage lift stations, sewage treatment plants, we're taking the effluent water and using it for frack water type applications. Uh, at this case, at the sewage treatment plant itself, the water leaving the plant um, there's so many variables. Today we might be feeding five or six customers uh, and we might have many temporary customers like a frack water application. So we have to be able to manipulate our pumps at the pump station at the sewage treatment plant as we're using this supply water. In this case we try to design for worst case maximum flow scenario uh, and we put in a surge vessel to try to balance out the flow uh, and a transient monitoring computer so that if a particular frack water application in the future is, starts to create a transients that could be damaging to our piping system, this computer system has an alarm so that if they accidentally are, say, pulling you know, 4,000 gallons per minute, shut in their system, create a huge transient wave back into our piping system, this computer system is going to record that at 100 times a second and then it's going to send off an alarm so that it can be addressed in the field that, you know, whatever this application is, they're damaging our piping. Uh, this would be another application of a reuse water application. And again, here we're trying to balance the flow based on the demand. So you can't see in the picture, but to the right, we have three variable speed drive pumps. Uh, and we're trying to maintain a minimum flow.
Uh, we have a flow control valve, which is the purple valve right in the middle. When we get into reuse water, reuse water piping, everything is uh, purple pipe. Uh, and when we have transient waves, um, we have a, a, a surge vessel to give energy to that negative wave leaving the pump station. And as you see, there's a lot of components in this pump station, from the pumps, the control valves, the air valves, the surge vessel. All this goes into the computer modeling. And again, we'll get into more detail in this particular pump station uh, when we look at reuse water applications. So we're going to look at uh, a little bit of the, the modeling scenario. And again, this is a 24-inch line. We have several locations where we're supplying, you know, a whole zone that's being um, fracked for the natural gas and oil. Uh, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten major sites. And at each one of these sites, we would have a frack skid trying to maintain that flow and pressure going into the injection well. Um, so the, the first thing that we look at in the design is taking water. So we can look into our model and look at our pump station and look at the details on the, the feed water to the uh, frack system and the pumping data you'll see in the top left hand corner. And we look at, again, the worst case scenario in our change data in the model. We can look at the worst case scenario, which is a pump trip. So we're running the pumps. We're looking at the worst case scenario, which is a pump trip. And if we're giving receiving energy properly in the model, um, for starters, so you can understand the worst case scenario, if we don't give any energy in the surge vessel, we'll go ahead and turn that off. I'll expand out the model and bring back in to show you, again, the end of the line, which would be the worst case scenario. In the end of the line, what's happening, we'll zoom in. We have an active valve in the model, so we can open and close this valve and look at the cause and effect of that time step when we close that valve and how it will affect our overall piping system. And then we look at the flow control valve that was in the picture in the skid. In this case, the customer wants to feed their injection frack water pump with 1,640 gallons per minute. This particular control valve here, you can see here's my setting, 1,680. It's a little off. Um, that's the flow rate. So this control valve is a hydraulically operated control valve. We take the differential across a, an orifice plate and have a set flow rate. So when this valve is in operation, it's maintaining, I can put a mag meter, flow meter, I can take a Rosemont differential pressure transmitter and record the flow across that orifice plate. So we can maintain exactly, if calibrated system, that flow rate. And we can look at the whole overall um, cause and effect as I'm feeding this, um, this particular frack application if I had a pump trip, again, that wave's going to oscillate through the whole piping system, through this control valve. And as I say, the shock wave, the shock wave is traveling at, and I can zoom in on the, the piping profile, the shock wave is traveling at 3,655 feet per second, okay? So it's like a, a bullet traveling through the system. So you might say to yourself, oh, if you have a water hammer the shock wave occurring, you know, won't that valve or a pressure reducing valve, you know, maintain, you know, the pressure so it won't let the high pressure wave go downstream. You know, there's a reaction time to all those valves. And again, this wave is traveling so quickly that the valve doesn't have time to react. In those cases, that's why we have to put in, you know, a surge vessel, a dampener to accept and give energy instantaneously. Um, so we're going to look at what happens in this piping system.